Here we are. It's the physics video lecture. PSI 168, video lecture 23. And there's an exam coming up. I was going to keep talking about entropy, but I think we're just going to do a brief exam review um, so that everybody's informed. And then we'll do new material after we take the exam. So the exam is on Wednesday, October 14th. And the time would be 11 o'clock to 11.50, which is our class time. So realistically, what I'm going to do is send it out about 10.50 and have you guys turn it in by, say, 12 o'clock. Yeah, 12 o'clock. That gives you time to take pictures of the, you know, print anything out if you have to, or actually really just take pictures of all your solutions and make sure they're nice and email them to me. Okay. So in class, we would just have these 50 minutes, but of course we have a little more this way. Good. So what's going to be on the exam? Ah, before we talk about what's on the exam, let me just write here. Email your completed exam, which is to say pictures that are very easy for me to read. Um, if possible, you could even have them converted to PDFs, but the problem is I don't really intend to print out that many pages for the entire class, so I'll, I'll grade them reading them on the screen. Okay. So email the completed exam, the, the pictures to my email address. Okay, that's, the, that's the email address from which I send things. Email them back to me. Not to, not via Canvas. Okay. A couple people have been trying to do that. That's not working for me, okay? You have to send them to this email address. I'm not using the Canvas account. Okay. So send them to here and of course your subject oh, that's the first thing. Um, open a new message. New message to this account and then your subject as usual is your name PSI 168 exam okay. okay that you know that worked very well and so it'll work this time too except that we're under this time constraint so I said this last time already, but I don't mind repeating myself. We're trying to have all the questions unfold in the way that the whole subject has been developed, roughly. So there are questions that require calculations and the right answer, but there are also questions that just require a written description. And I give a lot of partial credit, so if you're weaker on the calculations, try to make sure you're stronger on the written description. And uh, so what are our topics? more than enough here, I'd like for you to know the shape and size of Earth argument. So, you know, you practice it and you know how the geometry works and you can actually do the calculation using this geometry here and the parallel incoming rays to determine the radius of our Earth. And also, you know, you can mention how did we know the shape, how do we figure out the size. Okay, so th that's a whole really interesting topic, and we use this in various uh, connections during the semester. Geometry and everything. So you want to know this calculation. And then we also have free fall 
and satellite orbits. You, know, you can have everything lined up in preparation for the exam because this is what I'm going to be asking you about. So free fall and satellite orbits and you know that one's interesting because you know, we have the idea that it's a horizontal throw and if you throw it hard enough it just keeps going around the earth okay, if there's no friction right? and it goes way back to Newton and the geometrical construction there was a beautiful application of the Pythagorean theorem so here's the radius of our earth the right triangle that L was the distance traveled in one second and that H that little h there was the distance fallen in one second. So yeah, you want to review that calculation and be able to do it, given some numbers. And uh, You know, I could say, instead of the Earth, I could have us do it for the Moon. If we did it for the Moon, I would have to supply you with different numbers here, but you'd have to be able to do the same thing. Okay, so free fall and satellite orbits is a good one as well. Then, forces and geometry. So there we're talking about triangles. You know, like the example where I hung a mass here. You know, I hung my 10 newtons, and then I had these tensions there, and we used similar triangles. So those are the... the strictly mathematical ones. I'll keep a list going here. So fourth topic would just be to know the definitions. Definitions and examples. Definitions and examples. Force. Work. Potential energy, both kinds of energy, kinetic and potential energy, and power. Now, you're better off using the ones I gave you than the ones you could look up online. My definitions are better. Because I've, I've seen where people come up with stuff that doesn't sound quite right to me, and I know they read it somewhere, and they didn't really understand it. We've covered these things really thoroughly, so you've got definitions and examples just so that we can read examples, definitions of force, work, energy, and power. That's really the heart of this, this course. And then as a practical applica application, oh, and also five, what does conservation of energy mean? conservation of energy. So what does that mean? And then actually the centerpiece of the whole thing of applications is the hydropower example. So the hydropower, of course, that's our cartoon with the lake and the power plant and all those good things. And we know the potential energy, MGH, and how to calculate it. We did a really great problem how to calculate it. And then the power formula, M over T, GH. So that was the flow rate, G, the height, gave us the power in watts. Um, so everything in kilograms, by the way, Everything that we do is in kilograms, meters, seconds, and the quantities that, you know, newtons and watts, they're all built up out of kilograms, meters, and seconds. Good. So yeah, and, and a question like this, you could describe really nicely if you're not as strong on the calculations, but make sure you know the overall picture. Nothing's gonna be that hard anyway. So you got the hydropower, and this one's really rich because we're going to include our thermal physics in this, the solar energy as the course goes on, 
electricity and magnetism. We haven't done those things yet, right? But we're ending with hydropower and some thermal physics. So yeah, the hydropower, and a really important one is that energy or work is equal to, best way here, well, let me go ahead and write it this way. Remember we had the three versions of this definition in this formula. So power is energy divided by time, but then energy is therefore power times time. Energy is power times time, and for example, you could have a thousand watts times in one hour. So the kilowatt hour, and then you could convert it to joules, and it was 3.6 times 10 to the six, so 3.6 million joules, but that was from this definition just rewritten, right? Cross multiply, W is T times T, and we even had time, if we solve for time, it's the energy divided by the power. So yeah, this is the this is the one that's going into the hydropower formula, and, and we have those other ones as well. Well, good. I'll call this the hydropower discussion, and then that's actually more than enough, isn't it? Because I want you to write something about all these topics, but since we've gone quite a ways into thermal physics. We could also discuss, let's make that straighter. Um, here, the mechanical equivalent of heat. This is a good one. This one contains so much and we say one calorie is equal to 4,186 joules. So this is just a rich problem or discussion point because you have to know what a calorie is. And uh, so there's all the thermal physics on this side and you have to know what a joule is. So there's all the mechanics on this side and then there's the equal sign which, mean, which relates those, okay. there's more than we could actually talk about in the context of the one exam. But if you know things on up to here, then you'll be in good shape. Okay. So all the way through to the mechanical equivalent of heat. Um, there's a lot more to come in thermal physics, but uh, we've, all, we've already done a lot. So if you have mastered everything we've done so far, you know quite a bit about energy already. So, um, and you know, the friction, the joule churn, all those things um, into here. But this type of question would be more the generalities and writing down the, the, the associated concepts as opposed to having you calculate something, okay? When we're doing it, when you're calculating something, we've got our shape and size, we have free fall, we've got force triangles, and above all, we have the hydropower example. Those are the ones we'll calculate stuff. Um, now, I'm not that adamant about conversions, but I just mentioned the kilowatt hour, so the energy, one kilowatt hour being 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules. You know, and understanding where that comes from, that's a good thing, good thing to know. Okay, I don't think I need to say more than that. It's a short, short discussion. Well, that's a short, we have plenty of time. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and talk about entropy and stuff after all, okay. <clears throat> so let's see here. You know, this is actually a decent place to start, but I will say a bit more about 
entropy. Okay, so we're back in thermal physics. And I was talking about heat transferred, so heat flowing from one place to another. I'm going to do a whole lecture later on about heat transfer, but for the moment, I'm sticking to this one example, heat transfer. The example is, this is perfect, if this were a bar of steel and I had my torch here on one end, or say a copper bar would be better, had my torch on one end, then this end here would eventually get very hot, okay, because the heat would transfer along this metal bar all the way to my hand. So the cartoon for that is that we've got our candle, from here on out candles are butter candles, so there's the flame. There's the copper rod, and we said that the, you know, what we would measure is that the temperature at this end, we'd be held a thermometer up to it, would eventually be increasing. We held it in our hand, the sensation would be enough to tell us. You just travel along here, or you could move your way along, and as you went towards this end, it would be getting hotter and hotter. So it would be hottest at this end, coolest at this end, and the heat would eventually travel on through. So I indicate it like this. And then what that turns out to be, if you know about atoms and molecules and their existence, is that the higher temperature region has more molecular agitation. Okay. So there's that connection. First of all, just empirically with the sensations, but then if you know about it, it's the molecular motion. The molecules are moving faster when the temperature is higher. And uh, if the temperature is zero Kelvin, that is to say as cold as cold can be, then the molecules are not moving at all. Okay? And that's why it can't be any colder than that because there's no speed slower than zero. Okay. So that's the idea of heat transfer, and on the one hand, you can say we have the flow of heat from the higher temperature to the lower temperature, and this is always the case. And on the other hand, you can say it's the, it's the transfer of that molecular agitation from one region to another. So over here we have higher speed molecules and molecules, and over here we have slower molecules. So what I had finally come to last time is saying that we had disorder more or disorder versus order. So ice versus water, order and disorder. We're going to talk about um, phase transitions later on, and the phase transition will also be an example of the same thing, order and disorder. So, um, yeah, molecular, so entropy, measure of disorder okay, so the same object at a high temperature has more disorder therefore it has more entropy at a lower temperature less disorder that they more order therefore lower entropy so it's a measure of disorder and so we can use this concept to talk about this one and vice versa. Here we're just saying energy flows from hot to cold. Okay. It doesn't flow the other way around. Here we're saying disorder is increasing 
over here if the energy flows from hot to cold, okay? Because this one's becoming more agitated. So there's the entropy concept. Now, I want to talk first about energy and entropy to show how they tie together. Got some examples of that. And then I'll get into some technical, de uh, technical definitions. So my example for energy and entropy is the following. Suppose we have a, an, a bouncing ball on a table. We're just going to have to imagine this now. We've got our lab table here. And we take a tennis ball and drop it. Okay. We drop a tennis ball from this height. Of course, we always label this height H, don't we? H above the table. And what happens? If it were an ideal ball, it would just keep coming up to the same height forever. But in fact, what happens is it bounces one, two, three, five, ten times or something, and eventually it just comes to rest. So the question is, where did that energy go? Because when we lifted it here, before we dropped it, we did some work on it, it had potential energy, and when it comes to rest on the table, it has none. The answer is, is that the molecules in the ball and in the table became agitated with every blow. Okay? With every blow, they became more agitated. And by the way, as an aside, if you if you want to experience that, take a pound on a nail with a hammer. Okay. You don't have to get too vicious, but you know, pound on a nail with a hammer a bit, and then grab the end of the nail, and you'll feel it's much warmer. Okay. So the work you've done has led to increase in temperature. Same thing here. The molecules in the ball and in the table have become agitated, and in fact, that agitation is going to spread. So the table became very, very slightly warmer, and then that warmth spread. So the point is that energy was not lost, okay? It was transformed into warmth, into heat, okay? Transformed into internal energy. So the energy was not lost, but the ball is now on the table. Now here's something that will never happen is that the ball will spontaneously start bouncing up into the air again. Okay. By energy conservation, it could. All these molecules could reverse their motion. Energy would come back together and kick the ball in the air. It'll never happen, though, unless you play a movie backwards. So what that illustrates is really this once again. Heat flowing from hot to cold and not in the other direction. So these are both laws of nature. The heat flows from high temperature to low temperature, and the disorder increases. When all is said and done, the ball is on the table, and everything's a little warmer. OK, so that's the link between energy and entropy. And now I'm going to go ahead and formulate it. terms of what are what's called the two laws of thermodynamics. So energy and entropy next laws of thermodynamics. Laws everybody should know about, right? Laws of thermodynamics. The first law is, in the most general sense, it's conservation of energy. So we've already talked about that. But what we've done now is we've added heat. We've added thermal energy to the mix. So conservation of energy 
still has the same formulation as before. Energy is not is neither created nor destroyed. Energy is energy just changes form, but now we know it changes from potential to kinetic, changes from potential to kinetic to thermal, which is a form of kinetic energy, and back again. Okay, so we have conservation of energy as the first law. The second law is that the entropy of a closed system increases. Now this is this is going to need some more explanation. Okay. The entropy of a closed system increases. So if it increases as opposed to decreasing, we need some quantitative formulas to describe it now. I've just been describing it in terms of order and disorder, but we can hold on to these two statements, and this one I'm going to introduce, um, let delta S equal change of entropy. We're always just going to talk about a change. And so we'll talk about change of S, delta S, and not S itself, okay, delta S. So, but we're saying that S is always increasing. So change of entropy, um, and I'm going to define it this way. Consider um, Q flowing into a body. Okay. So we have, here's our cartoon, you know, we have this object here, a body at temperature T. It's T in Kelvin. So with the entropy discussions, we have to be talking Kelvin all the time. Okay. Q flowing into body at temperature T. Here's our cartoon. Okay, Q flowing in, and then what we have here is delta S is equal to Q divided by T. I'm going to put an absolute value sign so we make sure that's positive number. Okay. So Q flows into this body here at temperature T, then the change of entropy is Q divided by T in Kelvin. So what we're next going to look at is thermal energy flowing out of a body. Consider, now consider an isolated, let me write this here, consider an isolated system. So what we're doing is we're actually taking a hotter object and a colder object, oops, I'm supposed to say PC, Taking a warmer object and a colder object and putting it in, you know, putting it in a cooler and closing the lid. That's yeah, an ice chest closing a lid. So for this isolated system, which is what I've done, I just put it in the cooler. Um, here, delta S total is equal to delta S, I'm going to call it this H here, plus delta S for that C. Okay. 
leaving the hot, entering the cold. That should be working. I'll take it over the left side board. So the total entropy there, we put this thing in the cooler, keeps flowing from hot to cold. Delta S total is equal to the one that's flowing out of the hot is this one here, minus Q over TH, and it's flowing in to the cooler one, so it's plus Q over TC. Now we're going to do a little bit of algebra here. We'll pull out the common Q, and then we'll rationalize this. We'll have P C minus T H over T C minus T H. Other way around, T H minus T C. Now that's something that we got to make sure. Okay, make sure you see this step. Okay. Cross multiply T H minus T C rationalize. Okay. Now, higher minus lower is always positive. And what this example tells us is that the flow of energy from hot to cold is equivalent to the increase of entropy in an isolated system. This is always greater than zero. So I think that's what I'm going to leave us with. That's right. So, so here's the important result. Delta S total greater than zero is equivalent, an equivalent statement to, ener um, to energy flowing from hot to cold, flowing from TH to TC, from hotter to colder. So why do we even need this? Because no one was arguing with me about energy flowing from hot to cold. We're going to make great use of this later on with the heat engine. So it's good to have seen. Um, there are much more technical versions of this, but uh, this is fine. There are versions of this whole theory that relate it to the actual molecular motion, okay? the molecular state of our object. We're not going there. We're just taking this Q. We know that Q is measured in joules, okay? P is measured in Kelvin. So it's joules per Kelvin would be the units right here. I'm gonna leave it at that for now. I'm going to come back to it so that we really get a, a nice, want to get a decent understanding of these laws of thermodynamics. What the second law means is what I've just illustrated with my example. Entropy of a closed system always increases. So we'll, we will return to this, just to make sure we have a good feel for it, after we take our exam. Okay, so good luck on your exam, and see you guys next time.